who invented Christianity? I'm a creativity researcher, and for over 20 years, I've been studying how new things come to be. When I was asked to give the sermon today, the first idea I had was to see if we could use our understandings of creative processes to explore the origins of a religion, the Christian religion. So my comments this morning are meant to be an exploration, an attempt to see what happens when I apply our contemporary understandings of innovation to better understand the origins of Christianity. After several decades of research, my colleagues and I have discovered that all innovations emerge from the same common patterns. All new things, whether they're computer software, board games, Reese's peanut butter cups, a Simpsons animated cartoon, all result from deeply human and social processes. To demonstrate these common patterns, I could have chosen just about any invention, but for today's sermon, I've chosen to tell you a story about the world's best-selling board game, it's Monopoly. In December of 1934, Parker Brothers bought the rights to Monopoly from its inventor, Charles Darrow. By April of 1935, only four months later, they had already sold 200,000 copies. They would go on to sell over a million copies that year. That many sales for a game was just unheard of back then. And on top of that, it was the Depression when people didn't have a lot of spare money to spend. Well, Parker Brothers' official story of how Charles Darrow invented the game Monopoly goes something like this. One day, he was reading a book. It was about a boy in a vocational school. Well, the instructors in the vocational school, to help the students learn about uh, negotiation skills and stock market trading, the teachers at the school, they created a simulation activity. They gave the students a fake paper money that they had made, and they gave them fake stock certificates, and they asked them to engage in buying and selling and negotiating deals with the fake money and the fake stock certificates. Well, Charles Darrow was reading about this activity in the novel, and he had his big idea. This would make a great board game. He went down in his basement, he got some cardboard and scissors and crayons, worked out the game which became Monopoly. Uh, this creation story, it paints Charles Darrow as a kind of classic American folk hero, right? Small town boy made good with his great idea. But there's just one problem. <laughs> Darrow's story is a complete lie. <laughs> he did not invent Monopoly. And the real story about how Monopoly was invented is a perfect example about how innovation always happens. The real story starts back in 1879 with the radical ideas of an economist named Henry George. George argued that rents on land and rent for housing was immoral. And it was bad for the economy on top of that. So his solution was to create a single tax on land. It would replace all rents and he also wanted to abolish taxes on wages. His followers became known as single taxers. And it wasn't some crackpot movement either. His 1879 book called Progress and Poverty, it advocated the single tax and it became the best-selling economics textbook of the 19th century, still one of the best-selling economics books of all time. Leading scholars around the world at that time endorsed the single tax. The single tax was particularly popular among American Quakers and they viewed it as a more just way to organize our society. But the single taxers, as you can probably imagine, they were opposed by powerful forces. Uh, anybody who owns land, anybody who's getting rent, uh, anybody who's employing somebody else. Uh, by 1900, it looked as if the movement was going nowhere. Well, a lot of the Quakers who were big advocates of the single tax were getting quite frustrated. It had been a few decades and they were getting no traction. There was a Virginia Quaker named Lizzie Maggie and she said, I've got to do something about this. People need to understand the single tax is the most just and humane way to organize society. How can I convince people of the virtues of the single tax? Her idea was to create an educational board game. Um, she called it the landlord's game. The players moved their pieces through spaces that were arranged around the edge of a large square shaped board. Uh, they started on the upper right corner and the space was called Mother Earth. It actually had a little sketch of the planet. Uh, Lizzie Maggie's hatred of capitalism was pretty obvious because the spaces had names like Lord Blue Blood's Estate. <laughs> <laughs> and another one was the utility was called the Socom Lighting System. <laughs> well, and she created two sets of rules. Remember, it's an educational game. One set of rules was for the capitalist version, 
where it was clearly evil because one person got rich and owned everything and everybody else ended up penniless. <laughs> then she created another set of rules for the single tax. All players became equally prosperous in a socialist utopia. Well, <laughs> Maggie couldn't get any of the game companies at the time to publish her game, and that included Parker Brothers. So she shared it for free with her Quaker friends, and many Quakers were dedicated single taxers, and they actually ended up really liking the game. Turned out to be pretty fun to play. Uh, but because you couldn't buy a copy, each family had to make their own version of the game. So what they would do is they would, you know, uh, they'd play it once with one of their Quaker friends, and then they'd go back home and they'd cut out a piece of canvas or linen, and they'd get some crayons, and they'd make their own version of the landlord's game. Uh, by 1910, a common custom had emerged among this Quaker communities up and down the eastern seaboard where when they made a copy of the game, they would change all the space names to be streets and neighborhoods in their town. So if you were in uh, whatever city it was, you'd have your version of that game. Um, soon after that, another new rule emerged. Some anonymous players got the idea that if you grouped three of the same colored properties together, that you could start charging more money. That was the monopoly. And by around 1920, this new rule led to a new name for the game. It started to be called Monopoly instead of being called the Landlord's Game. Around 1930, there was a Quaker teacher named Ruth Hoskins, and she moved to Atlantic City, New Jersey. She brought uh, the Landlord's Game with her. Of course, it was called Monopoly by then. And so she made an Atlantic City version of Monopoly. Soon after that, Charles Darrow, well, remember Charles Darrow? <laughs> <laughs> Charles Darrow, who lived in Germantown, Pennsylvania, he was visiting some Quaker friends in Atlantic City. Uh, and for evening's entertainment, they brought out the Atlantic City version of Monopoly. Well, Darrow liked it so much, when he got back home, he made his own copy of the Atlantic City version. And he got a patent fraudulently by claiming to be the game's inventor. And then he went to Parker Brothers and sold the game. <laughs> and made up his false story, right? about reading the novel about boys in a vocational school. Uh, the real story didn't come out until the 1970s when Parker Brothers lost their copyright to the game in a court battle. With uh, and a fascinating story, many very old Quakers with white hair were testifying <laughs> <laughs> about what happened back in the 1920s and 1930s. Okay, well the story of Monopoly demonstrates three key facts about human innovations. The first one is they always emerge over long periods of time with many different people making contributions. Lizzie Maggie started it off, or maybe it was Henry George, right? And she didn't even come up with the idea of grouping properties into sets of three that they were monopolies. Uh, other players thought of that later. And it was the Atlantic City Quakers who named the spaces that we all know today, right? Many of you probably know that the spaces on the Monopoly board are streets in Atlantic City. Uh, but that was Atlantic City Quakers. It was not part of Lizzie Maggie's 1904 invention, right? Okay, a second feature of innovation is that during these long periods during which the innovation emerges, uh, there are evolutionary dead ends, lots of them. Experiments and trials that die out. Maggie's original rules included the single tax version, but we don't play that way anymore. I guess it just wasn't as much fun as capitalism, right? <laughs> Um, the third feature of innovation is we always make up a story after the fact that makes it seem as if one person's unique vision was the cause of the innovation. We conveniently forget all of the precursors that led to the innovation, and we make it seem as if it was a radical break from the past. Well, I told you about Monopoly, but I could have told you very similar stories about just about any other invention. Uh, the airplane, the telegraph, the automobile, the mountain bike, all very similar stories with the same three characteristics. So what does this have to do with Christianity? Uh, scholars who study the origin of Christian thought have discovered that Christianity emerged from exactly the same human and social processes as the board game Monopoly. The, historic, the historical story of Christianity has the same three features. The first feature of innovations demonstrated by the Monopoly story is that they always emerge over long periods of time with many people making independent contributions. Christianity likewise emerged from a large number of writers, rabbis, scholars, also pagan traditions that were widespread through the Greek and Jewish world at that time. In pre-Christian Jewish writings, there are many stories about heavenly redeemers who became a person and then returned to heaven. Many pre-Christian texts contain the idea that a martyr's death could atone for sins, 
and could result in immortality. This was a common belief in Paul's first century world. The geographically dispersed system of thought that resulted in Christianity, it was much broader even than Judaism. It included a lot of popular pagan myths as well. For example, one cult worshiped a savior god, Osiris, who was dismembered in a violent death and then was reassembled by Isis and brought back to life. The Romans told many ascension stories about figures like Romulus, Empedocles, Augustus, and many other Roman figures. Early Christians, by the way, were deeply familiar with all of these other beliefs of these other cults. The pagan cults actually embarrassed early Christians so much they felt compelled to explain away the seeming parallels. For example, in the second century, there was a Christian named Justin Martyr. He wrote about the pagan mystery cult of Mithra. Mithra, they believed in a virgin birth. They served bread and water as part of their mystic rites. Justin knew that these practices and beliefs predated Jesus. So to explain away the similarities, he argued that the devil knew that Christ was going to come and what he would be like, and therefore the devil invented false gods and myths in advance <laughs> so to resemble the Christianity that would later emerge. So that Christ, and the devil did this so that Christ would seem less impressive. Right? Of course, the devil would want to do that, right? Uh, just like Monopoly and every other human innovation, Christianity emerged from complex social processes, each small idea contributed by a different source. No single person was responsible, there was no magical event when it all became clear. The second feature of innovation, there are always evolutionary dead ends. One of the best known in Christianity is Gnosticism, you know, G-N-O. Gnostics believed that a special mystical knowledge, something like a heavenly password, that was the key to salvation, and that this knowledge was reserved for people with true understanding. Gnostics believed that a spiritual messenger must come to awaken us from our material dream and bring us the secret knowledge. Not all Gnostics were Christians, by the way, but for the Christian Gnostics, that messenger was Christ. And by the way, for Gnostics, Christ was pure spirit. His body was only an appearance, so he never was born at all. Uh, a second dead end was a variant founded by a figure named Marcion, Marcion was an early Christian teacher who rejected the Jewish God as evil. He rejected the Old Testament, of course, and also many New Testament books that he thought were overly influenced by Judaism. Marcion's teachings were rejected by the church at large, but he founded his own church. It lasted for several centuries as a rival to the Orthodox Christian church. Like the Gnostics, Marcion also taught that Christ was not material and was not born and in addition, he taught a form of universal salvation. Just as Monopoly had different variants in every city, there were multiple independent strands of Christian thought. There are many other lost variants of Christianity with names like Montanism, Manichaeism, and others. This is why there are substantial differences between the four Gospels and between Paul's letters, because all of these texts emerged independently from pre-existing strands of thought. This social and historical process is exactly what we find in every other creative process, variation by elaboration of ideas. Okay, the third and final feature of innovation. Eventually, one final version emerges from these social and historical processes, and afterwards, it seems to be our human nature that we create stories about how one person's vision created the final version. These stories ignore the historical variants, and they exaggerate the differences between the innovation and what came before. Christian scholars over the years have worked hard to distance early forms of Christianity from its pagan and Jewish precursors with the intent to protect the uniqueness of Christianity and to argue that it's not derivative. But this effort obscures the ways that Christianity emerged from already existing ideas, merged together in a new way. Today, theologians from just about every Christian denomination almost universally acknowledge the historical facts I've told you this morning, that Christianity emerged from the same inventive processes as every other human creation, inventive processes that are deeply human and social. There is no historical evidence that Christianity's origin was different from that of any other human innovation. Well, I find this story incredibly empowering it shows the power of people working together to create something new and meaningful. 
something that lasted for thousands of years. Our reading for today at the beginning of the service, written by the French sociologist Emile Durkheim in his famous book analyzing the origins of religions around the world. He concludes in his book that society has a creative power which no other observable being can equal. And by no other observable being, he means human beings, right? Society has more creative power than any one person. He means that all of us together are more creative than any one person alone could be. While none of my sermon today addresses the question of whether Christianity is true, God might have chosen to communicate the truth to us through these deeply human and social processes. In fact, there are many scholars, like the famous authors J.R.R. Tolkien, who wrote Lord of the Rings, C.S. Lewis. They believe that God made Christianity in familiar mythical forms so that it would be easier for people to understand the truth. So asking whether or not Christianity is true, it's like asking whether monopoly is true. If you're trying to explain the origins of a human institution, it's not the right question to ask. As Durkheim says in today's reading, there are no religions which are false. All are true in their own fashion. All answer to the conditions of human existence. So rather than ask questions about truth, better questions to ask about religion might be, does it aid people in their suffering? Does it help us understand the human condition? Does it bring us together into affirming communities? Does it help us live a fulfilling and meaningful life? Does it carry us along our spiritual journey? Does it help us faith, face death and adversity? These are the questions we should constantly ask ourselves about our own church, and may we continue evolving and growing so that the answer is always yes. <laughs>